the thing. So uh, while they switch cameramen in the back, because my daughter's on the camera at the moment, I'm going to invite her to come up here for a special announcement and uh, opportunity that we're going to take. I don't get to do this very many times in my life, and I'm, gonna, I'm the pastor, and I can get away with it. So um, that's why I'm going to do this. I'm going to ask my daughter, Annika, to come on up here. Mom's going to come up here and join you. This is Annika's last Sunday with us here at Faith Family, and she's going to be headed back to Nashville, where she will be with the Nashville Ballet, dancing in their professional division. Uh, it's a big step up from where she was last year, and they invited her to come back. Um, and, to, and to be a part of what they are going to be doing there in Nashville. I know they're going to be doing Sweet Sleeping Beauty, Cinderella, Nutcracker. What else? Is there something else that you're going to be possible? Yeah, there's a fall showcase. And a fall showcase and don't know what it is yet. So, and she just came from Lauderdale from down there and dancing down there at Swan Lake and a bunch of contemporary pieces. Anyhow, this is what she does. She's a dancer. God has, has, has just, I don't know how it happened either. We have no idea. <laughs> We put her in dance in order to, she should learn some grace. She learned how to dance. There is no grace. So the, uh, that, just, that, that part didn't happen, but she can, and, uh, and, and to do that, she was untied. So anyhow, uh, she'll be leaving Thursday, Thursday, right? They're going to be headed up and uh, going to be driving back to Nashville. We're going to pray for her safety and everything else. She will not be coming home Christmas because she has to be in Philadelphia just a couple of weeks after that. So she has to stay there in order to participate in the Youth Ballet. I go. American Grand Prix. The Youth American Grand Prix Ballet up there, which is a big, big, big deal. And she's going to be working hard on that between now and then. And we'll be able to watch that online, right? So we'll get the link to you so you can go watch it online whenever that happens. I, I know I'm going to hit you in the face, but that's all right it is. Uh, and I'm not Italian. That's what's so funny uh, to be able to do that. So come here, Annika. You've done a great job as our youth intern this summer. We had no kids. Now we have seven kids. And we have a youth room that's almost done. And uh, we're having a wonderful time. We're going to be uh, doing, having a party tonight and seeing you off and kind of a back-to-school bash for everybody. But uh, I want to pray over you. Everybody wants to pray over you and that you have a great, safe year up in Nashville. Her and her mother have been doing this all summer. So if you kind of wonder what's going on, I'm, I'm used to it. Lord, I thank you for what you've done. Lord, we lift Annika before you that you will keep her safe. Keep your hand upon her, no injuries. Give her favor wherever she goes, in her church, at, Ball at, at Nashville Ballet. I pray that she has favor with her teachers, favor with her friends. She'd be injury-free, that you keep her safe. Lord, you have a reason. There's a re this is all in your will, God. It's not by chance. This is what you have ordained in this moment, and you have provided for it every step of the way. So we ask for your protection and your provision upon her. And, Lord, her safe travel and, Lord, her time there and that we will continue to lift her in prayer and believe that this next step in her life will be a blessing and glory unto God, and we will thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. God bless you. All right, so you can go in speech. <laughs> if I'd have known that had shut her up a long time ago, I'd, <laughs> I'd just keep one of these around the house. Bless you. See ya. All right. <laughs> she has way too much caffeine in her. Oh, my goodness. Now I'll dismiss the kids and head on back to Kids Church. God bless you so much. Miss Betty's going to be back there with you. And uh, continue with everyone here online. We're dreaming big this summer. And uh, we're going to be doing this through the month of August. We're going to be picking up a new theme the 1st of September. I'm excited about what God's going to do. And it ties in to dreaming big. So I want you to be a part of it and believe God for it. It's going to be a wonderful time. And I'm believing God has done a lot of things in people's lives this summer to prepare us for what's going to be happening coming September, October, November. I got, we got some great stuff coming online. And I believe that God is going to be able to do great things in your life. Hope Groups is going to be taking a whole new face, a whole new turn, a whole new... Uh, uh, um, 
I don't even know how to put words to this. It's just exciting stuff coming in September. So for the month of August, we're going to be talking to you about our Recover class on Wednesday nights. We're going to be continuing to do that at 6.30, both on campus and online. And then there is going to be a new class called God Chasers from the book God Chasers by Tommy Tenney, which Greg and Debbie Palm, I didn't even correct my notes in this one either. And uh, I, this, whatever. But uh, they're going to be doing a bi weekly study out of that book that will be a blessing to you. If you're looking to get closer to God and discovering what He's doing in your heart and life right now, this is a class for you to be a part of. I Wed with Randy and Donna Shore is going to be going on also on Saturdays. They are going to be opening our home for you to come and be a part of. I think it was home or church. I think it's home. Yes, it is at home. And so that's something for all of the married couples to be a part of. If you want to strengthen your marriage, going to it doesn't mean you have a bad marriage. Going to it means you have a smart marriage. <laughs> You're keeping it strong, and that's what you want to do. Men's breakfast will continue on the third Saturdays of each month. The River on the third Fridays of each month. Young adults with Eric and Nicole Nelson is also going to become starting bi-weekly, doing Bible studies and fellowship together. You can go to our website, click on Hope Groups. You can find out more about those things there. Sign up is going to be on August 21st. So you want to find out what you want to be a part of. You want to talk to these guys. Some of them are going to be talking to you. You want to be a part of it, and we are going to, those classes are going to be limited in size for the most part, some of them, and so you want to make sure you get in first, and that's going to be on August the 21st whenever we have that sign up to do that. There may be more coming, so make sure you pay attention to that page and to our announcements on this next Sunday if any more uh, classes open up that you want to be a part of. I'm kicking off the series Known today. And it was a really powerful uh, time that we had together at the end of the service just a little while ago at the end of that message. And I'm praying that it's going to be the same for you here this morning. And also remember, August 26 through 28 is going to be our marriagement retreat here at Faith Family Worship Center, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And uh, for those of you who are wanting to, and if you're thinking about getting married, that's probably something for you to come and be a part of also. I hadn't even thought about that till right now. So for those of you who are going, thinking about getting engaged, you're all engaged. For those of you who are married, you've been married 30 years. You need to show up as it will strengthen your marriage. We believe in marriage, and we want to invest heavily into the success of what God is doing in and through your marriage. So enough of that said. For all of our guests online, thank you for being here. There will be a little thing pop up there in the chat on the side that gives you an opportunity to let us know that you're here. Please let us know. We want to give you an e send you an email, let you know, th say thank you for what you've done. I didn't get enough coffee. That's why the words are coming out different. The, uh, that's my problem here this morning. So I want you to be a part of that. Thank you so much for being here today. Now, thank you for keeping Faith Family Worship Center strong through your tithe and through your giving. It has made all the difference in the world in our future. And even though that, they, that we're in a not recession right now, we're, we're, yeah, I don't get it either. I, I, I see this stuff online and I'm going, what? We're, in a, we're not in a recession. We are in a recession. But we, and I, listen, when I, I've learned this a long time ago. When I listen to economists, they, they're like chicken little. Their sky is always falling. They're like, yeah, things are great right now, but wait six months. You know, uh, all the rest of this. Here's what I know. God is in, God, in charge of my economy. God is in charge of our economy. He's our provider. Not the government, not big business, not the everything that we have comes from God. And we put our faith in Him and keep our faith in Him. He takes care of us even through the toughest of times. So whether you give online at ffwc.us or use, give via Cash App or whether you give here in the auditorium back at a kiosk, thank you for your giving as you continue to give. Now I've talked about spirit-filled giving all this summer. And, and, and for a lot of people, they, people think giving has many faces to it. There's what God says. There's what the church says. And then there's the guy on YouTube or Google or whatever platform you go to who says something. And I've noticed that nobody agrees with anybody. Everybody's got a different opinion and all the rest of it. Here's what I know. And it comes out of a thing called a Bible. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse number 3. If I gave everything I had to the poor and even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. And so here's the thing about spirit-filled giving, about giving and an offering, about giving your time, whatever it is. 
generosity is rooted in love. Generosity is rooted in love. The, the times that you, think about it, the times you, you have been most generous in your life has been with the people you have loved the most. Amen? They brought me water. God bless them. It's water, not coffee. I'll take it. But, oh, that made a difference. And so whenever we give, when love empowers our heart to give, let me say it again, when love empowers our heart to give we make a difference amen now this week i was walking out of staples and there's this young lady there and she's hard of hearing i can see the hearing aid she's hard of hearing and uh if you don't know betty and i've worked with deaf for many years before we came here to faith family and and so she's there and i can hear her and and i know she's hard of hearing everything else and she's raising money for dare the dare project every thousand she is just straight up a great salesman she is going for it you just don't see this package though you know you're like this doesn't scream salesman to me but she sit there and she starts and she's working it and yeah you're okay yeah and, and uh, so I gave something to support what they're doing for that. It's like 30 bucks and something along those lines, everything. That's giving to a charity. Now, I didn't think twice about it until right now. But I remember gifts that I have given to people that mattered to me. And it mattered to them. That God inspired me to give that has changed lives. Churches that have been built in countries I'll never visit. Lives that have been changed in, in homes and places that are dedicated to releasing people from addiction and from life-controlling problems. All of these things we know, and I know for you, giving is a big deal, but when you do it in love, it changes you. Giving changes you. Yeah, we give, and we want to give to see our kids grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. We want our youth to grow up and not be weird. Somebody say amen. Sometimes we're okay with that, sometimes not. But uh, what we try. We want marriages to make it, amen. We want families to make it, amen. We want people to know Jesus. And so that's where your giving makes all the difference in the world. So Lord, I thank you for what you're going to do in the hearts and lives of your people right now. As we tithe, as we give, Lord, I pray that we be a blessing to each other and to a world that hates you. But we will love them in your name. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, amen. amen. Psalms 139, 7 through 12 is where I'm going to be going today. Psalms 139, 7 through 12. No, I didn't get the notes on you version. That's on me. Sorry about that. So if you're looking for it, they're not there. Some days I just miss it. Okay, so... Somebody walked up to me a while back, and they said, I want to know Christ better. Now, um, I'll be honest with you, that kind of took me back. Really, it did. I, I, I was like, excuse me? Nobody ever walks up to a pastor and says, I want to be a better prayer warrior. No, nobody ever walks up to me and goes, I, I, I want to know the Bible. I want to read it and understand it every time. I, no, we don't get those questions. Hmm, you th go figure, right? So whenever the, somebody said this, I was a little taken back by it. And, and as it's the person is saying it, they're dead serious. I mean, they really are dead serious about it. But after a few more questions, I discovered that the person wanted to know about Jesus, but they really didn't want to know Jesus. And what I find oftentimes is, is that whenever we allow ourselves to get out of sorts with Jesus. We want to know more about him, but we really don't want to know him. We want, don't want to get that relationship with him that makes all the difference in the world. During their years with Jesus, the disciples tried to understand him and his actions, from, but they were doing it from their point of view. They were Jewish, traditional, legalistic, and they were a bit arrogant, to be honest with you. And they knew a lot about Jesus, but they struggled to understand him. And even whenever he, he was telling them things and showing him them his greatest acts of love, the light bulb was not going on. A couple of weeks ago, I made this statement. There's a big difference between American Christianity and biblical Christianity. They're not the same thing. The faith I see being taught in some churches and, and online tells people about Jesus, but it never introduces people to Jesus. 
Now, whenever we look at this and, and you think about what's going on, to be a follower of Jesus without knowing him is going to lead your faith to a place of frustration and failure. You say, I, I, I got faith in Jesus. But if you don't know him, if he doesn't know you, it's going to be very frustrating. And at the moment, this moment, you may be questioning your faith. Now, hang in here with me. You may be questioning your faith. You may be questioning the church. You may be questioning God. You may be in a place where your faith is struggling, okay? But I, I want you to understand, number one, God isn't afraid of your questions. He's not afraid of your questions. Ask away. I know some people that say, well, if I talk to God about this, he's really going to get mad at me. God already knows you're thinking it. If he was going to get mad at you with you, he'd already be mad with you. Come on. It doesn't work that way. Go ahead and ask him the questions. Number two, God is the God of your doubts. And you look all the way through the Scripture. Look at the great names. Look at the people in the Old Testament and New Testament. And all of them struggled with their doubts. And what did God do? He reached down from heaven and go, bam, hit him on top of the head. No, he did not do that. He was their God through their doubts. He took them on a journey that strengthened their faith because they were willing to let him lead. Some people call this the deconstruction of faith. If you're new to that term, you know, so a lot of people says, oh, people are de deconstructing their faith. People have been deconstructing faith for a long, long time. What is it? Deconstruction of faith is you take your faith, you tear it down to its core, and you put it back together the way that you believe God wants you to put it back together. Now, Moses had his faith deconstructed. It spent 40 years out in a wilderness for God to rebuild his faith to a place where he could lead the nation, the Jews out of Egypt. Paul had to have his faith deconstructed. It was all legalistic and Old Testament and a whole bunch of rules and laws and stuff like that. And God got a hold of him on a road to Damascus and changed everything and rebuilt his faith so that he could lead the church into all the world. Now, here's a warning that comes with all of this. It's, it's a warning from your pastor, so you just understand. I want you to remember this right here. Everybody, listen online. Listen carefully. If you are struggling with your faith, there is someone who would like to offer you a cheaper, more accommodating version. There's somebody out there who's trying to offer you a cheap faith. It's easy. It doesn't cost you anything. And you'll still go to heaven. We're going to deal with that here in a minute. If you're going through a time whenever your faith is being tested and you are in a wilderness and you're asking tough questions, let me know. First of all, let me let you know, you're normal. Somebody say amen. Yeah, a lot of normal people in the room. We've all been there. We all, some of us are there. Some of us are going to be there in the future. I can guarantee that statement. But I want you to know today that there are some things that you can do that will allow your faith to be reformed, reshaped. Faith is not, I'm getting ahead of myself, but faith is not something that is static. In other words, it just isn't there like this pulpit here in front of me. It always will be a pulpit. It's static. Faith is a living, breathing thing. It is something that changes you. It should be changing you. It should be challenging you. It should be making you uncomfortable sometimes. It should be encouraging you. It should be you know, tweaking, you know, taking you by the ear. You know that. Some of you know what that means. It should be doing something to your, to your life right now. So here's a couple for a few things. Here's a few pointers. If you're going to go through this, here's what I want you to know. Number one, the Bible is the truth. This is a Bible for some of you. You use, you use the online thing. This is, this is what you get online. It's one of these. <laughs> I found my Thompson Chain Bible today. The, uh, um, the, 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 some of you have Thompson Chain? What's that? Oh, gee, I just dated myself. But anyhow, sorry about that. If you're seeking to know Jesus, read his book. Specifically, which ones? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That's a great place to start. If you want to know who God is, here he is. His character, his will's revealed. It's all right in there. Now, to all the haters out there who want to show, throw some shade on the Bible, if you believe that God is the creator of life, 
If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, if you believe there is a heaven, if you believe that there is salvation by grace through faith in Jesus, then I want you to know that God, that He can keep His book just exactly the way He wrote it. We live in a world today that wants to throw as much doubt on this book as possible. Let me tell you what you get for that. Absolutely nothing. I mean, you get no church, you get no faith, you get nothing. You start interpreting this book with your life instead of letting this book interpret your life. You end up with nothing. And I see a lot of people online and they want to, you know, say what their two cents are about this and that and first one thing and then another. And in the end, I'm sitting here thinking, you just gutted the Gospels. You just removed all hope out of this book. You just destroyed its message. And you want to sit there and call yourself, they call themselves pastors and ministers, and yet you're desecrating the very thing that God has called holy. Yeah, you don't want to mess with this. God can keep his book just exactly the way he wrote it. He's okay with that. You say, well, people get caught up and they get tar- carried away and they do all sorts of stuff. And, and, and I've heard, yeah, I, I agree with that. We can see all through history. Whenever mankind starts taking off and doing all sorts of different things, it's like this rubber band. It takes off and then it starts going in, 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 and it starts doing this. And you're thinking, oh, people have lost their mind. In the late 1800s, let me tell you the, the story. In the late 1800s, most of religion in America did never preached a gospel of Jesus Christ. They didn't preach a, a, a salvation message. Salvation by grace through faith was, very, was hardly ever heard of. Instead, what was being preached from pulpits is, is that God has blessed mankind with such intelligence that we are going to turn our world into a beautiful utopia. It's called modernism in those days. And God has blessed us with the ability to bring world peace. And we are going to eliminate all diseases. And we're going to eliminate poverty. And we're going to, anybody, anybody here recognize any of these messages going on? And the church was just bought into it hook, line, and sinker. And it was just taking off and interpreting the Bible and some of the weird, dumbest stuff you ever, God's like, how did you get that far off base? And all the rest of it. And then something happened. And that's what happens whenever you start getting away from the Word of God. You can stretch that rubber band out as far as you want to, but eventually it's going to snap back. God will always return to His Word. You can argue with it all you want to. You're still going back. Now, what happened was in the early turn of the century, there was this thing that happened in in, um, well, it's Topeka, Kansas, wasn't it? In Topeka, Kansas in 1901, there was a bunch of people in this kind of a Bible study thing, and they were reading the book of Acts, and they said, well, they prayed and spoke in tongues. I guess we should do the same thing. And they started praying, and next thing you know, they're all speaking in tongues. And a revival broke out in the land that swept the world. And all of a sudden, there was this message, this brand new message that was being preached in pulpits all across America and all over the world. What was that message? Jesus saves. God had returned back to the original message that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life and the only way to get to God. And that our future is not dependent upon our intelligence. Our future is dependent upon our faith in knowing Him and Him knowing us. The goal is to know what you believe and to do so with passion and with vision. The goal isn't to create your own religion. That's what a lot of people are doing today. They kind of get these, 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 you know, kind of get their own man, imagine a monogram right there with my name on it, but they like to make, build a faith like this. Okay, I'm going to put this in here. I'm going to put a little that in there. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Okay, there's my religion. Here's my faith. This is what I'm going to do. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to do this. I don't really need to pray. I don't, I don't have to do this. Everything works fine, and, 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 and there, there they are, and that, this is their religion. And this is what they're going to live by. This is what I want. This is what I'm going to do. And this is what they think is going to happen, that whenever they get to heaven and they stand before God and everyone stands before God on on their day of judgment, they will hand this to God and say, I remain faithful to this. And God will take it and look at it and go, well, that's nice, but I think I'll judge you with this instead. 
Because the Bible says that our lives will be held accountable to this, not what we make up. So our faith has to line up with God's Word. If you're going to allow your faith to change, see what the Bible says about it. And the third thing is, the point of all of this is to discover it. Now, if I had a name for it, I'd have a name for it. All I can tell you is that you know it when you got it. Hello? And you, you want it. You, you want it. And, and the best way I can describe it is, is it's a hunger to know Christ so well you genuinely experience a life-changing relationship with Him because of it. Amen. You want to be so close to Him, He changes your heart and your life. And we know it when we got it. Hello? Amen? Amen. And you know what else? We know it when we don't have it. This is what the prophets and the patriarchs experienced. This is what the disciples in the early church experienced. And it's a promise to you and to me today. This is what hope groups and ministries are for. People are turning to YouTube and social media now more and more often for their theology. And these are great platforms to teach from. But who are you listening to? I have to challenge you that. Who are you listening to? Well, this guy is a pastor and this is what he said. Where did he get the title pastor at? People say, I'm a reverend. Where'd you get that from? Out of the back of a magazine. I paid 20 bucks and I sent it off and they sent me back an ordination certificate. And now I'm a reverend. And let me tell you, to the guy who spent four years in, in <laughs> Bible college and has a degree in Bible and theology and spent three years in apprenticeship in order to get ordained, <laughs> you're not a reverend. That's probably a little personal for me, but never mind. Anyhow, if you're struggling in your faith, Work with people that you trust to tell you the truth in love. Amen. Ephesians 4, 15. Work with people who you trust to tell you the truth in love. Amen. And if you see something online and you question it, call them. Is this true or not? We're, we're not here to make it easy for you. I got something that the, that the church got. I don't know how that all happened. I got a theory behind it. But nonetheless, somewhere along the line, we thought we were supposed to make faith easy for people. I read the Bible, and it was never easy. It wasn't even easy for Jesus. Think about it. But it is possible. With God, all things are possible. We're here to help you know Him better. But that isn't just going to happen on a Sunday morning with a casual acquaintance of greeting people as you come and go. But as you get into deep relationships with people who are around you, who will encourage you, who will be there for you, who will pray there with you, who will be there to encourage you. Don't go through life alone. Don't go through life just thinking, well, I'm just going to find people of like-minded faith who will invest into you and allow the Holy Spirit to pull back the curtain on your heart and reveal you for who you really are. But I don't want to see that. I don't understand that one. I talk to people, let God do that. I don't want to know what's in there. You already know what's in there. That's why you don't want the door to open. It says it, behold, I stand at the door and knock. You know what we're doing on the other side of the door when Jesus is knocking? We're trying to clean the room. You'll never get the room clean. Just open the door. He's there to help you. He isn't asking for your perfection. He's asking for your passion, your heart, your love to believe in him. Psalms 139, I probably should read this. I can never escape from your spirit. This is what King David says. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest, dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and you will strengthen, you will support me. I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. King David writes this. He says, I can never escape from your spirit. Here's a question, are you running away from God? One of the greatest lies Satan will tell you is, you can run away and nobody will notice. Wrong. Wrong. Adam and Eve ran away from God and God showed up in the garden and said, where are you guys at? 
Jonah ran away from God, and God showed up and helped him go back in the right direction. Don't suggest that one. Saul was running away from God, and God found him on the road to Damascus. God is always running to you. Run to Him. People are running from God as fast as they can today. Millions of people have left the church altogether or abandoned the concept of church over the last couple of years. But half of them still identify as followers of Jesus. But they don't go to church. They want a religion that doesn't require church. Remember the, remember the bag? The, they want to do their own thing. That's not going to work. What does the Bible say? Matthew 6, 16, 18. Upon this rock... Jesus tells to Peter, upon this rock I will build my church and the powers of hell will not conquer it. Colossians 1.8, Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body, is the beginning supreme all the rise from the dead, so he is first in everything. The church is, is here. The church is for you. You are the church. I understand why people say Jesus is the hope of the world, and they're absolutely right. This world needs Jesus. Somebody say amen. But it is the church that seeks to know Christ and to be known in His presence where we find real hope. The church makes all the difference in the world. We think that we can stand back away from the church. We don't have to get involved with the church, and we can still go to heaven. You know, just because I stand outside a burning building doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to get fried, but the church is a gift from God to where you are so you can be known. The church is a gift to you. What is the church? An organization, an administration, a charity? No. Oh, those are legal aspects about the church, but that's not who we are. According to the Bible, the church is people who have placed their faith in Jesus for their salvation. So everybody around you is saved. It's the church. Turn to someone there near you and say, you're the church. If you're running away from the church, now you know who you're running away from. You're not running away from an organization. You're not running away from an administration. You're not running away from a bunch of rules. You're running away from the very people who are here to love you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And my question to you is, why would you do that? You are a person who is created in the image of God. You were created to be loved. And God says, through my church, I will love you. So that's why it's important to be a part of ministries and a part of small groups. Because those are the best places where you can find the love of Christ for one another and be encouraged in His name. People may be running from God, but the church, His people, are running to Him. Whether you're in-house or online, we're running to Him. The dissatisfaction is our satisfaction. I know this will be a revelation for some of you because you think church ought to be perfect. No. We go out of our way to make sure we're not. We just go ahead and live up to our name and get it over with. It's a lot easier that way. We're not here to be perfect. We're here to grow. We're here to be dissatisfied in the moment so that our faith will grow and take us on a journey to the next place that He has in store for us. And I want you to go on that journey. I want God to know you and for you to know God so well that He's taking you to the next place in your heart, in your life, in your faith, in your calling, in your future, in your ministry, in your family, in your, whatever. He wants you to grow in those things. People say that the church should meet every need. No. <laughs> oh, no. The church can't even address them all. Jesus meets our needs. Now, the church is happy to introduce you to the one who will do it. The church is happy to teach you. The church is happy to be the one there that's there for you. God designed your faith to grow and change. Your faith isn't static. That's where I got ahead of myself. It's living. It's breathing. It's alive. Your, church, your faith will grow 
as you allow people to invest into you. God gifted you, the church, with leaders and teachers that will make it happen. Listen to me. We are living in a time when everybody's got to be independent. I've got to be independent. I've got to live on my own. I've got to do my own thing. I've got to just, that is just a bunch of bunk. I can't find it anywhere in the Bible. Nowhere in the Bible that it says that you're to be independent, self-made person who stands on your own two feet. I am the man. I am the woman. Whatever. You're here. You're called to be interdependent upon him, upon your Lord and Savior. Uh, and, and we are here to be here for one another. And w- when we're a part of a church, we, we let it. Now, a lot of people like to call me and tell me what their need is. The pastor will take care of it. No, he won't. Jesus will. Well, I should call you, Pastor. You know, there comes a point when we grow, you can't call me anymore. Because <laughs> all I'll be doing is just going from phone call to phone call all day. And then you know, all I'll be doing. Here's the deal. Did you know that God calls and gifts people with the ability to show you what the Bible says and means? And he calls people to minister to you? And he calls people to be able to make a difference in your life? And they're not religious nerds? Oh, some of them are nerdy. Yeah, I get that, but that's not because they have faith in Jesus. They were nerdy before. All right, but the, but the fact of the matter is that they have heard from heaven. What's the last thing heaven's told you recently? What's the last thing God's told you recently? What's the last person that you've encouraged in the name of Jesus recently? Who have you shared the word of God with recently? And who have you let speak into your life other than me? I'm a given. I get that. Who else are you letting speak into your life that you trust to speak the truth in love? From theologians to hope group leaders and ministry directors, God planned it that way. God planned it that way. You're looking at me going, but pastor, this is going to cost me another night, a week. It's going to cost me this. It's going to cost me that. Hey, when you get to heaven, you think you're going to really gripe about that? Come on, get real. God called you, and he wants to know you. God gifted your friends to encourage you and love you. How many of you got to hang out with your friends if you're going to let them encourage you? Just, just, a few, just a few seconds a week isn't enough. Come on. Just a little time here and there, that's not enough. You need to spend some time poking fun at each other, having some fun, laughing together, hello, crying together, sharing each other's burdens together. It's what we're supposed to be doing. And you say, well, what, what, what? you will know Christ, and Christ will know you. That's where it makes the difference. David said, I can never escape from your spirit. I don't want to escape from his spirit. I don't want to hide from him. But if you're looking for a faith that doesn't require a relationship with him or in his church, you're going to be disappointed. If you're looking for a faith that allows you to do what you want to do and you kind of still kind of stay saved and everything's okay, you're miserable. You don't even want to sit through, through, the, through the next part of this sermon <laughs> when I get to the challenge. You want to run. You want me to shut up. You're looking at your watch, and you know that I'm on a clock. And you're thinking, I can just hang in here about another five minutes. I'm going to make it. Maybe I won't. You see, we are so focused on what we are doing, we don't pay attention to what God is saying. We need to quiet our heart and listen. Say, well, who's speaking? He is. Faith is dependent on this one principle. You know God and he knows you. 
Faith isn't something you just agree to. Well, I believe in God. Well, so you believe that there's an entity somewhere in the heavens, be all be that where it may, and that entity knows that you are one little spy, kind of a fly of a speck of a person here on the earth. That's not faith. That's just acknowledging each other's presence. Faith changes you. Faith messes with you. Faith takes you places you didn't want to go. But faith does things in your life that you will appreciate. I'm talking about a relationship that enriches and empowers and changes your life. That's the kind of relationship that you need. It isn't the faith of your parents. It isn't the faith of your mentors. It isn't the faith of the assemblies of God. It isn't the faith of the church or the religious leaders or mine. It is your faith. That's what it means to be known. Have you allowed Jesus full access to your heart? Have you allowed Jesus full access into your heart? Everything. I mean everything. Everything. The whole thing. Are you listening? Have you let him go places you're ashamed of to speak to you about things that embarrass you. Things you prayed to God. Lord, don't let anybody see that part of me. Oh, you've all prayed it. Now, don't go there. Be honest with yourself. If you want God to know you, you know, want to know God. Don't try to base your relationship on a lie. He already knows everything. God is all-knowing. He already knows and he still loves you. He already knows and he still thinks the world of you. He's still crazy about you. Just go ahead and say, God, here I am, just as I am, without one excuse. Don't lie to yourself to avoid the responsibility. Don't dodge the question in order to justify your faith that's right over there. Is Jesus real to you? If the answer is yes, he's changing your life. If your life isn't changing, your answer is no. He's not real. You're paying lip service, but you need to take that next step and say, I need to stop. Stand with me if you would across the auditorium. Those of you there with me, let me pray with you. As heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I ask, how many of you here today would say, I need to let Jesus in and be real. No more playing. No more faking it. No more making my faith comfortable and accommodating and nice, and clean. I want a real relationship with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that changes me. I really want that. It is about joining a church. You're not joining a church. It isn't about joining a religion. You're not joining a religion. It's about a relationship with Him, and that relationship is what changes your life. And I want Him to be real. How many of you here by upraised hand, as heads are still bowed, eyes are still closed, who say, yes, pastor, pray for me? I want Jesus to be real. Thank you. God bless you. If you're online, thumbs up or some hearts. I want to pray for you too. Jesus needs to be real. I want to know him, but I've got to stop playing the game. And I need my life to be real with him. I want to know him and I want him to know me. Who else here today say, yes, pastor, that's me. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I pray for everyone who raised their hands here, for those of the here online. I pray that you will pour out your spirit upon them. In the name of the Lord, I pray that you will do a work within them. Change their heart.
that they know you. Show up in a way that they can't, they can't deny. Be with them right now with no excuse. No excuses, Lord. We just set it all aside. We're not, what is it you want from me, Lord? I must draw closer to you. I want you to get closer to me. And if that's your prayer, pray it. I want to get closer to you, Lord. Help me to be able to do just that. Help me to find the right ministry, the right hope group. Help me to be able to find the right time, the right place. Help me to be able to do that. I know hell will fight me and give me every excuse in the world not to do any of this. But I must, I must be a part of your church. I must let these people invest in my life. And I've got to return my life back to you, Lord. I must give with love. And I'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name I pray. And everyone said, Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. God bless.